Uh, welcome everyone to the mock trial part. Uh, if you didn't, if you haven't noticed it so far, I'm not Sharon Hannes. Uh, he couldn't make it. So if all of those of you, you know, uh, came here looking for a smart and good look looking moderator, you'll have to wait for another opportunity. Uh, this is, uh, th this trial is about uh, the love triangle of face, uh, tick, and meta. Uh, there are, uh, the description of the facts is outside, and it's also available online at the ONO uh, website. Very briefly, this is a story about uh, a company that decided to be sold. It had two uh, suitors. Uh, one made a conditional offer. Uh, the other made uh, an offer that was uh, on its face more attractive, and then even agreed to raise the bid, provided it uh, had the opportunity to secure deal certainty. And the mechanism for securing deal certainty in this case was uh, what's often called in the US a force the vote provision. Uh, and this is one of the questions that is going to be discussed today, whether you, we can uh, make that happen under Israeli law. And uh, a voting agreement uh, by the controlling shareholder of the target, uh, Zeus, uh, that agreed in advance to vote for uh, the transaction and vote against any alternative transaction uh, within 18 months uh, from the period of the original merger agreement. And as it often happens and as expected uh, by the uh, bidder that signed the agreement with the company, uh, the first Bidder that, the bidder that was first, that first made a conditional offer then raised its bid and now uh, we're looking at an injunction uh, and we have a very distinguished uh, group of speakers, of uh, uh, lawyers representing both parties and uh, judges and this is going to be an Israeli introduction where I'm just like, uh, uh, you know, not providing details about the past, just uh, who we are, who are the people. So. Uh, Lori, uh, Lori Will uh, from the Chancery Court in Delaware, Justice Offer Groskop from the Supreme Court, Justice Ruth Ronen uh, from the Supreme Court in Israel. Uh, for the plaintiffs, uh, Ted Mervis and Rochelle Silverberg from uh, Wachtel. Uh, and for the defendants, our own uh, Udi Sol and Ilanit Lanzman from uh, you and I. Uh, the, rules, uh, the rules of engagement are 25 minutes to each party, and then uh, the court uh, will make, uh, announce its decision. And I'm just hoping that it will make it interesting for all of us, and I urge the you know, judges to intervene and ask questions and make life difficult for the parties. Good morning, and may it please the court, Ted Mervis, of the plaintiff law firm of Zohar Goshen and Associates. Um, with the court's permission, uh, I and Ms. Silverberg will divide the plaintiff's argument. I'll address the force to vote provision in the face tick merger agreement, and Ms. Silverberg will address the 51% no out vote lockup entered into in connection with the merger agreement, and perhaps also a word about the breakup fee. No facts, at least none known to us, are in dispute given Professor Amdani's masterful one-page, 326-word, 327-word hypothetical statement of the case. And for plaintiffs, as we noted in our opening brief, we accept that the FACE Board of Directors was predominantly independent and disinterested, and we accept that the Zeus Agreement to bind itself irrevocably for 18 months to vote for the $12.50 tick offer, come what may of higher value, was not the product of any interest in conflict with the interests of other stockholders. If I may, one last note of table setting. We will all be arguing from Delaware case law, in part because Israel has no law on forced to vote provisions, or so I was assured by Professor Goshen, 
and specifically no statutory authorization in the company's law and because this case requires the court to confront, to accept or reject the Delaware Supreme Court's 2003 decision in Omnicare where Delaware put its stake down and decided that if one couples a force to vote and a majority shareholder vote lockup, that is just outside the director's toolbox. In corporate law, Delaware and Israel have long been closely related. As this conference, and indeed the composition of this court, attests. It was at this conference in 2006, I was then 10 years old, that then, the then president of the Israel Supreme Court, Justice Aaron Barak, and Delaware's then Supreme Court Chief Justice, Myron Steele, debated whether Israel should create a business and corporate law court akin to the Court of Chancery in Delaware. Justice Barak argued against it. As I understood the justice's point, it was that there should be no specialized courts of any kind, no labor court, no surrogate court, no family court, because every issue was of constitutional dimension, ultimately turning on reasonableness, requiring all judges to be constitutional experts. That was not exactly music to a Delaware ear. Then came the Goshen Report, the Economic Division, Tel Aviv District Court, and as they said in Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. And so here we are. Where Israel has been said by prominent Israeli academics to quote, lead the global pack in adopting Delaware corporate law as the basis for its jurisprudence, and that the case law in the Economic Division is quote, saturated with references to the legal decisions of Delaware judges. Saturated, maybe, maybe it's a translation thing. And where the Supreme Court of Israel has recently ruled that principles of the business judgment rule, if not Delaware's creation, certainly the emblem of Delaware, are quote, an integral part of Israeli corporate law, albeit with appropriate adjustment to the Israeli company's law. And where at this very conference in 2018, the president of the Israel Supreme Court noted that Israeli courts tend to examine and draw inspiration from Delaware law when dealing with complex corporate issues. I'm not saying that the justice had our case in mind directly, but the general point remains. In this case, we submit that the common thread to both parts of plaintiff's position springs from the same well recognized in both Delaware and Israel, where both the Delaware General Corporation Law, Section 251, and the Israel Companies Law, Section 314, assigns to the board, the board of directors, the role of gatekeeper, to exercise judgment in an informed and effective way in deciding whether merger proposals should be accepted or rejected, and to recommend to the stockholders what the directors believe is the optimal course in their best interest. One principle. One principle we submit guides all of the issues in this case. As the Delaware Supreme Court put it in Omnicare, if a board decides to accede to a then higher bidder's quote, ultimatum for complete protection in futuro, that is per se improper. Why? Because the board, quote, has disabled itself from exercising its own fiduciary obligations at a time when the board's own judgment is most important i.e. receipt of a subsequent superior offer. Now on the force to vote provision in particular, the Israeli Supreme Court's notation about adjustment of Delaware law per the company's law is important and I submit distinctly apt. In 1985, the Delaware Supreme Court decided the famous case of Smith v. Van Gorka, which remains to this day, I think, the only case ever to hold directors personally liable for conduct and takeovers, and not for thwarting an unsolicited high-priced offer, but for agreeing to sell the company at a 40% premium in cash to market. Why? Because the board, said the court, had agreed to the merger without maintaining the unfettered right to call it off, to terminate the agreement. That is, the Delaware court held that the board's gatekeeper role for mergers under Section 251 of the Delaware statute simply did not allow the board to submit the merger to a stockholder vote while recommending against it. As the Delaware court put it, certainly in the merger context, a director may not abdicate that duty by leaving to the stockholders alone 
the decision to approve or disapprove the merger. Strong stuff may not abdicate by letting the stockholders decide. But here what we have is the fourth devote clause, uh, supplemented by a fiduciary out uh, clause. So the, the board can bring the decision to, to, uh, to the shareholders, uh, but allow them to decide and uh, bring his current opinion in front of them. Nothing prevents them from saying to the shareholder, well, we suggest that you will not accept uh, the offer. So wh why is it problematic in, in that sense? It doesn't leave the shareholders alone. It gives them its uh, current advice about the situation. The question will be better than the answer. But the answer is that under the reasoning of Smithy Van Gorkum, it's simply not open to the board to leave it to the stockholders. Now, I, le I say this leaving aside what Ms. Silverberg will argue, that here the fiduciary out is obviously meaningless because Zeus has a 51 percent vote yeah, locker. Let's assume that Zeus did, does not have right. a Let's assume they did not. So why, what's the logic behind that? Uh, the logic is that the board's duty, the board's fiduciary duty, particularly in the merger context where it's statutorily assigned the role, is unremitting and continuous. It cannot be disabled by contract. And if you, if you just say the board, oh, but the board is free to say, we just, we just found gold under the executive headquarters, or now we have a $15 bid from Meta. So now we recommend to the stockholders to vote against it, but we're gonna put it to their vote. No, the statute doesn't allow that. That's how the statute was read in Smith and Van Gorkum, and that's how I submit 314 should be read by an Israeli court. But, but why should we follow this uh, decision, this uh, long gone decision of the Delaware court? If, if they allowed the shareholders to vote and they give them full information, then basically they are saying, we don't support this deal in the uh, present uh, situation, but we allow you to decide because after all, it is your, uh, your property. You can uh, decide whether to sell or not. There's no such thing in Delaware, and I submit there should be no such thing in Israel, as a merger without board approval. Okay. And the board approval should not be only at the very beginning, it should be at the time of the vote. That's the role that's assigned to the board, and we don't permit the stockholders to make the decision on their own. There's no such thing as a hostile merger. So, so it's a formal issue. You need both the assent of the board and the assent of the shareholders, and if one of them do not agree to the deal, the deal is off. That, that is your connotation? I, I would say, it, yes, it's, it's both a formal issue, but it's not just a technical issue. It's a question of assignment of ultimate responsibility for the future of the company. The responsibility for the future of the company does not reside only in the stockholders. The board once the statute, and this is uniform in the United States, and it's clearly the case under 314 of the company's law, once the statute assigns to the board the responsibility to decide yay or nay whether to put a merger proposal to the stockholders, the concept is simply that that judgment, they don't turn off their brains upon signing the merger agreement. The, the men and women on boards of directors are obligated to continue to monitor the situation and decide if this is the right thing to do. And but Council, isn't that, that precisely what's happening here? The board is monitoring the situation, the board is able to exercise its voice, but the stockholders still have the ultimate decision, which is consistent with principles of corporate law. And, and the board gives full information. They, the, the stockholders know everything, and they are the ultimate people to... The stockholders have full information, the boards give them the full information at all times, and they have the right to decide. Well, yes, that's true. And again, I think forced to vote provision should be outlawed without regard to the voting agreement. In other words, it, it's because there's a voting agreement, I think we all have to agree, agree that the board's ability to change its recommendation is but the, then there must the, be a B toy for it's not worth the paper it's written on. Yeah, but then the the problem is with the voting agreement and not with the fourth the vote uh, provision. So, okay, but I, I am arguing that the force the vote provision should be held outside the boundary, even without regard to the voting provision. We and 
And you know, obviously... We are simply wondering why that's... Uh, yeah, I understood. Understood, because to me, the concept of the directors, that their responsibility does not end when they sign the merger agreement. Now, yes, they can monitor and they, they can recommend. But if, if at the time of the vote, the board has decided that the merger is no longer advisable for the stockholders, so, so let's and think. Then that, our position is that agreement should not be put to a vote of the stockholders. Stockholders yeah, you should not be allowed to inflict upon themselves, even even with full knowledge and full information, a merger that the board no longer considers to be oh, advisable. Okay, so l let's think about that. The board conducted a search. Uh, it did a process of evaluating uh, the offers and chose one of them. Now. The, the only obligation that it gives, that leaves aside the, the voting agreement, is that they will bring it to the, uh, to the shareholders. What's wrong with that? And there is a later development, and they bring the later development to the knowledge of the shareholders, and they give their advice based on this uh, change. What's wrong with that? Why is it so a breach of a fiduciary duty? Let's say in that circumstance the shareholders vote to approve it. They vote to improve an inferior deal by a vote of 51 to 49. Well, what's the problem with that? That's the, what the show. The problem want. with that is the board owed fiduciary duties to all the stockholders, and the 49 percent who voted against it, but are being forced to be cashed out at an inferior price by a vote of 51 percent, did not get the protection of the board's exercise of its fiduciary responsibility. That's always the problem about being a minority. You are forced by the majority. That's the rule of the game. In, in well, in that case. Why, why put the board in a gatekeeper role to begin with? Why not just say if someone wants to make a merger proposal, the board should hold a meeting, should no, no. say here are the pros and cons of the merger? You decide, stockholders. But, but this That's is not our system. But it's not the situation here. They conducted the search. They did all they should do in order to bring the best offer to the, uh, to the vote, to the shareholder vote. So why not allow them to continue? They, they simply put an end to the search. They say we search until a certain point and we do not allow later offers to affect what we bring to the table, to the shareholder table. What, why shouldn't they, they be allowed to do it? Because at some point, and this case proves it, by claiming that they can shut the process down at a certain point, at this point at 1250, they left $2.50 on the table. They did no, not go back not, to Meta. But it was not on the table. When they made the decision, it was not on the table. It was not in, on the table. Th at that specific moment, there was only one offer th on the table, and maybe if they did not uh, give the, the bidder the security he wanted, there would be no offer. Two oh. birds on the tree and none on, on, on the shareholder's hand. And the fiduciary duty of the directors is to give the best offer to the shareholders. That was the best offer, and maybe it wouldn't have happened uh, otherwise. In this case, Professor Amdani's uh, statement of the case allows me to say, I think. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> that they, I think what the staff was saying is that we don't have enough time. Uh, he's, he's telling me to quit while I'm behind. Um, <laughs> he was trying to help you, but you have no good answers, really. <laughs> well, I do, I do have one trump card I could play if I, if I needed to prove the affinity between Delaware and Israel, it's right on this kippah. <laughs> so, so I submit this as Exhibit A. Uh, for, the, for the rest of my argument, I uh, rely on our brief, and I turn now to Ms. Silverberg, who will address the, the voting agreement. Thank you very much. Thank you. May it please the court, Rochelle Silverberg, also for META. We've already discussed the force the vote provision. I'm here to discuss what we call the Omnicare portion of the argument. The current structure of the tick face transaction makes that transaction a fait complete, even though my client stands ready to offer a 20% premium to the deal already on offer. The combination of the force the vote provision, which requires the transaction to be, the tick face transaction to be submitted to the face shareholders combined with the voting agreement locking up the vote of the 51% shareholder makes the transaction a fait complete. It is completely locked up. The what? Excuse me, why didn't you give your very good offer 
at the first stage, you had a chance to give the $15 unconditional offer when you were uh, addressed by the board and then your offer was different. Merger negotiations are a process. Tick also did not give their final offer in the initial round of bidding. And in fact, the, the facts here show that even though there were two competitive offers on the table, FACE only went to Tick to ask them whether or not they would improve their offer, and they never went back to Meta to ask if Meta would improve our offer. So there was unequal treatment and is not unusual for a target to come back and say, we need you to improve your offer. What more can you give? We were not given that choice. And at no time during the process did Meta say that we had made our best and final offer, indicating that there was no more, and yet, FACE never chose to come back to us before locking up the agreement to ask whether or not we would improve our offer as they did with TIP. Ms. So Silverberg, why isn't that an exercise of the board's fiduciary duties? So faced with two offers, one with significant regulatory uncertainty, the board decided to forge ahead with TIC. You acknowledge the board acted in good faith, they were unconflicted. Why isn't that an exercise of business judgment? It is an exercise in business judgment, but in reviewing the court's decision making, it is our position that the court should adopt enhanced scrutiny over that decision as the Delaware Supreme Court did in Omnicare. This, the defendants concede, number one, that the transaction is locked up. The defendants also concede that if this court were to apply the Delaware Supreme Court's precedent in Omnicare, the deal protection measures cannot stand. So the question for this court is, should it apply Unical, uh, Un sorry, Omnicare under Israeli law? And the answer is yes. And let's begin with the facts in Omnicare and why the court ruled as it did and why those principles should be applied by the Israeli court here. Omnicare had facts very similar to the facts here. You had a target that entered into a merger transaction with another company, there was a force the vote provision, and there was a lockup committing 65% of the voting shares to vote in favor of the transaction. There was a owning only 20% of the shares. Correct, but they had the ability to force the vote, and, and they had the ability to cause the transaction to be approved, which is what is the case here. Omnicare made a higher offer, as Meta did here, and challenged the deal protections in court. The Delaware Supreme Court found that the deal protections were inappropriate, applying very settled Delaware law, namely the Supreme Court's decision in Unical. Unical is not a controversial decision. It has been on the books since 1985. And under Unical, Delaware courts hold that when boards adopt defensive measures, they are subject to a level of heightened scrutiny. They are not subject to automatic business judgment. And in applying heightened scrutiny, the court asks, was the defensive measure reasonable? And was it either preclusive or coercive? And the court found that because the deal protection devices were preclusive, they therefore did not survive heightened scrutiny. So the question here is, should this court apply Omnicare, which is functionally applying Unical to the current deal protection devices. If I can ask about that, how is it preclusive in this case, seeing as though Meta came forward with a subsequent offer? Meta came forward with a subsequent offer that has no chance of being accepted because there will be a vote on the tick merger and that vote will pass. Is it your position that Zeus was coerced to sign the shareholders agreement in this case? Um, the facts do not indicate coercion, but a under the facts in this case, it appears that a condition to tick entering into the merger agreement was the 51% voting agreement with Meta. Definitely, but that's not coercion. That's negotiation. Correct. And it's a fair. It's a fair thing to uh, to it's, demand. Right? It's not an obligation of the board. It's an obligation of uh, of Zeus. So it's a shareholder, a controlling shareholder, who take a commitment uh, to support the merger. Why? Why is it is not allowed to do it? 
the commitment was made as a condition to the merger. Without this commitment, the, the board was approving a merger with the understanding that it would be a fait accompli and there was no chance of a higher offer. But, but, it, but it could have rejected the offer. If the board had decided that it doesn't want uh, the merger to go on, it could Correct. have decided uh, against it. So it, it, it wasn't coerced or compelled in any way, and the controlling shareholders simply think that this is uh, the best offer uh, that they could get at that point of time, and it was willing to make a commitment. Why, why we should intervene in such a situation? Because that can, but the board, by virtue of approving a transaction that had no, that was completely locked up, approved a transaction that was preclusive. And the Unical test is disjunctive, meaning. Okay, so, so if the controlling shareholder uh, made the agreement after the vote of the board, it's all right? And if it make it before the vote of the board, it's not all right? If, uh, that's actually Orman v. Coleman. If yes. the shareholder, uh, oh, I'm sorry, openly. If the shareholder decides down the road that it wants to enter into a voting agreement, it of course can do it. But when you think about it, there's not much logic for a shareholder to do that because if the transaction was not conditioned on a voting agreement with Zeus, there would be no upside for Zeus a day later, two days later, three days later to lock up its vote because it would be irrational for Zeus as a 51% stakeholder to preclude the possibility that there may be another vote. The, Zeus the, gained nothing. The only rationality is that the, if they want this offer, the $12.5 offer, they need to make the commitment at that point of time. They cannot delay it. If they will delay it, uh, the offer will be off the table. But the board's decision in whether or not to accept the offer turned on whether the offer would be locked up and therefore preclusive of other offers. I'm not sure. The board decision was to accept the merger. The conditions of the merger was that the controlling shareholder will make the commitment afterwards. <laughs> if this is the situation, what is the problem with the board decision? It could go either way, and it decided that this is the best option that the company has at this, at this point of time. Uh -huh. And if I can add on to that question, the board had no role in the shareholder agreement with Zeus here, which is a distinction from Omnicare. Why shouldn't that matter? Well, it's not clear that the board had no role, as according to the factual record, given the factual record here, the board, in fact, the voting agreement was in fact a condition to TIC's willingness to enter into the agreement. So it was part of the overall merger negotiations and merger terms, even if it was entered into as a separate agreement. And if I have 30 seconds, I would just like to address one policy argument that was made in the defendant's brief. They argue that as a matter of general shareholder maximization from an economic policy, it is better policy to allow companies to lock up agreements because that way you're encouraging companies to make offers and you are not concerned about inhibiting companies from be being concerned about being stocking horses. Um, that is speculation for which they did not provide any data. And in fact, if you look at US public company m and activity in 2003, the year of Omnicare, there were $700 billion of US public company m and In 2019, the year before COVID, there was over $2 trillion of US public company M&A. So the fact that we do have Omnicare and no ability to lock up has not in fact impacted public company M&A. And in fact, what you're, the argument is once companies know that they can lock up a transaction, they will have no incentive to actually pay the most because the best way to lock up a deal is to offer a compelling price so that you don't have a topping better. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, we agree. We agree that 
the two measures, the force the vote provision and the voting agreement with the controlling shareholder and certainly ensures the approval of the shareholders for the TIC transaction, even if a truly superior offer had been submitted after the signing of the merger agreement. This results from the combination of the under undertaking to put the TIC transac transaction to a shareholder's vote and of the controlling shareholder undertaking to vote for it. However, we will show you today that in the special circumstances of our case, the board of directors did not violate its fiduciary duty. What is the legacy of Omnicare? Because you have an easy case, you have Omnicare. But we think Omnicare is wrong. And the Israeli court should not uh, obey Omnicare. Omnicare determines two fund fundamental concepts. First, the board needs to include a ring fiduciary out in the merger agreement. Otherwise, the board members will be held liable for breaching the fiduciary duties and the deep protection provisions will not be valid. And second, the deep protection provisions will be reviewed by Delaware courts, not according to business judgment rule, but in accordance to the standard of the enhanced scrutiny. Both concepts are controversial, not only according to legal scholars, but also by the two dissenting judges in Omnicare decision. Moreover, although other US states courts tend to look to Delaware, like Israel, for guidance on questions of corporate governance, we found an irregular refusal by such courts to adopt Omnicare. For example, in 2011, courts of appeal of California declined to follow Omnicare in the Monte case while stating as follow, we decline to follow Omnicare. An exclusive merger agreement may be necessary to secure the best offer for the shareholders of a firm. It is true that in certain situations, the shareholders may suffer a lost opportunity as a result of the boards entering into an exclusive merger agreement. But all contracts are formed at a single point in time and are based on the information available at that moment. So, so what is the point of time, remind me, in our present context? The what is the point of time in which the contract is formed? The point of time when the contract is formed and is when the uh, face board approved no. a face... No, it's not that. It's when the, uh, the uh, assembly of shareholders approved the deal. If there is a change after the board decision, let's say that uh, by some miracle, face uh, share uh, price goes up by 30%, then uh, the shareholders will not vote for the for the deal and uh, it will be off the table. So the point of time, if we consider it from the contract uh, point of view, is uh, the time when the, bo when, the, uh, uh, when the shareholders approve the deal. So if, if this is your position, then we should allow uh, free uh, options until this point of time? This, this is my position. Our position is that the board finished its job when it approved the merger agreement. Then it's for the shareholders to accept it or not. We don't why, think... Why is that? The board, fin the board finished its job. It doesn't need to negotiate any further after it approved the deal. But if there is another offer that the board didn't, didn't, uh, didn't uh, invite but came, mm -hmm. why shouldn't it be in front of the shareholders? And if it should be in front of the shareholders, why to tie their hands? We want to present a fresh look, not following uh, Delaware. We think that fiduciary out should not be part of Israel law. We think this is a game theory explanation. We think that if all contenders, all potential bidders will take part 
in the auction and they will, not, they will know that they don't have any further chance, any second chance to join the game after it was, will be finished, then all, all potential bidders will take part in the auction. And this will be maximizing shareholders' value. Look at this. But the question is, when is the game finished? Is the it finished after the board signs the agreement, or is it finished afterwards when the, when the, the, the game, the, the board, from my point of view, finish its job? Of course, if the board will receive an offer, I think it will have to bring it to the uh, to the shareholders' knowledge. But game theory wise, why, why do we prefer to end the game when the board agrees to the agreement? Why, why don't we want to prolong it? Because this is a policy question. As I said, there is no, uh, I, I didn't read in the Delaware court's decision, any reasoning, reasoning why we should have a fiduciary out. This is a, a game theory. Why not? This, because, this is, because I think if parties but, but you agree we know in the future yeah. that they, there is no fiduciary out, but, but you then they will all run into the auction. We did it in private auctions over companies. When we tell the parties, if you want to be part of the auction, you cannot, after that, bypass and bring another auction. You, you are right, but if I'm not part of the auction, Let's say, that, let's say that it's a third party who sees the offer, the, the merger offer, and, and think, well, I can do better and uh, give, uh, give a competing offer. It wasn't a part of the auction procedure. Why shouldn't it be, it be allowed to do it? Because I think if the board really did its job and made a good public search, a, a good auction, then there is no chance that sometimes out of the blue. But, but, but uh, rea reality here proves differently. There is another offer. It's a better offer. So if, it, it, if it's a better offer, then you can disclose it to the shareholders. They have the right to reject the original agreement. But I don't think that we should let the board change his mind. But, but that's it. No, no, the this, board, is, the board this is up to the shareholders. They can uh, vote against, uh, advocate so, uh, right. against the initial bidder. But you want to add something, please? There is also a collusion between the duties of the You're gonna, Please join us. <laughs> this is Israel. But How can the board exercise its fiduciary duties if it can't change its mind? I mean, uh, boards. Ah, uh, logvak moody. Boards. Uh, I mean, member of the boards have. Um, they have uh, all, all kind of duties, and you can't prefer the fiduciary uh, rights duties over the duties that they have when they do the agreement. Okay, saying that is that fiduciary out is. I mean, per se, no matter what, is telling the directors that they shouldn't. Uh, think of and, and, uh, and actually react to their um, uh, duties at the time of signing the agreement. They need to, as Udi said, make a market check, do negotiation, have an agreement. All those, I mean, they need in all those uh, activities to, um, to do the best for the shareholders. If, they will, if, if we are saying there is fiduciary out no matter what, then it's a collusion between both uh, duties. It's maybe something I don't understand about the fact of the case. There is a fiduciary out obligation in the agreement, in the merger agreement. So the directors are free to say whatever they want to the shareholders. So w what is the problem with the fiduciary out? The, the, you agree to a fiduciary out. No, but the problem is that it me. doesn't matter what they recommend That's to the shareholders. The shareholders vote is simply a formalistic matter. They, they, the, the merger will go on even if they, uh, all of them will vote against it because of the 51 uh, majority of the deals. This, this I have to agree. The fiduciary out 
in our agreement is not a real fiduciary out because the controller shareholder already secured its vote for the uh, 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 tick transaction. So it's not a real fiduciary out. But the fact that a, a controller who doesn't have any conflict of interest, who is ready and willing to share the premium with the minority and to receive the same price is not a coerced controller. And that, that is the mistake in Omnicare because the minority basically doesn't have a say in such situation where, where the shareholders receive the same uh, uh, consideration. Uh, I, there is also a, a, a judgment by Judge Strine that tell us that he will give the benefit of business judgment rule to a, a, a board where the shareholders, where there was a controller, and he agreed to split the consideration with the uh, minority and to get an equal consideration. There is a trade-off. If the controller is ready to split the consideration among, among all shareholders and actually to give up his controlling premium, then Judge uh, Strine tells us there is a trade-off. You will give the minority the benefit of your controlling premium, and I will give you, as a court, the business judgment rule. I think this is the way to look at it. And if question. Unical were to apply in this case, do you think this particular deal can withstand enhanced scrutiny? You know, uh, there is Unical and there is uh, uh, Omnicare. So according to Omnicare, maybe this case cannot uh, go through uh, from my point of view. But our, uh, our view Why not? is because our you view... You distinguished Unical. Hmm? You distinguished yes, Unical. Yes, I, I, dis I distinguish Unical. I don't need <laughs> First of all, uh, our audience need to understand that Unical was decided in a case of a hostile takeover. Exactly. What did Omnicare did? It actually applied Unical in case of a friendly transaction. This is one of the mistakes, sorry, this is one of the mistakes of the Delaware Supreme Court. It should not apply Unical to friendly mergers, because in a, a hostile takeover, the fear is that the, the, the directors are not really acting for the benefit of the shareholders. Maybe they want to entrench themselves by using all kinds of defenses against a hostile takeover. But what, what a conflict of interest has a director in an old cash merger, when he actually will sell the company 100% for cash, and he will lose his job, and sorry for my Hebrew, he will get a kick in the butt, and, and that's it. So there is no conflict of interest. Now, in our case, what is the difference between our case and from factual basis? And uh, uh, Omnicare. In Omnicare, the controller has 65% of voting and 20% in equity. This is the first uh, distinction in our case. In our case, the controller has 51% of all rights. So in Omnicare, one might say that the controller didn't have the same interest as the minority. Not in our case. More than this, and I think uh, uh, the judges in Omnicare didn't pay attention, the voting agreement with the controller, the 
the company itself, NCS, the target company, was a party to the shareholders' agreement. I think this is a mistake of lawyers to do. The what voting agreement should be between the controller and the initial bidder. And I don't think, in such case, the court can intervene in an agreement that is outside of the board of directors. This is above the company, and the board cannot intervene, cannot intervene at that. Thank you. Ah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> trying to be fair. I mean, no, 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 Go ahead. Uh, OK. Uh, um, I just uh, uh, I want to say something and then answer you about the enhanced scrutiny. Um, we want, uh, um, we believe that this, in this case, uh, we can't ignore uh, the synthesis and uh, which was given in 2012 and afterward Presidio, which actually gave a safe, safe harbor uh, to transactions that stands for three conditions. Uh, there is a controlling shareholder in the target, so the minority doesn't have any expectations for premium, we, um, it, it's in our case. The consideration in the sale is the same for all shareholders, minority and controlling, which also in our case. And the sale process was led by the board of directors and not by the controlling shareholder. This was uh, in Presidio. And uh, we think that those resolutions, uh, we need uh, to go with them. We just want to specify, it's not only in Delaware, okay? Israeli courts recognize sophisticated offerees in a few decisions, uh, the, the, the sophisticated furry doctrine. Um, I remind uh, that this doctrine applies in cases of appraisal rights in a full tender offer. And actually the courts recognize that the undertaking of a sophisticated major shareholder to support tender offer is a solid proof to the fairness of the consideration for the shareholders, um, specifically where a shareholder has the power to block the tender offer. But, but uh, here, but, but here it's not only. Uh, we have a sophisticated offer. We have a sophisticated uh, for offer. For sure, and but <laughs> just a minute. But but it's not only that uh, it's an indication that the deal is good. No, he, but he, he closed the deal. Yeah. Basically, the, the, the other shareholders have no saying. No, about, but it, it doesn't close it. the deal from outside or something. He has. The, I mean, the the the, the most, <laughs> but you know, big stake in the company. If he agrees to lock himself in such a price than this, and he is a sophisticated investor, both uh, facts gives you the, actually, to say that it's a right premium for all the shareholders. So he replaces the shareholders' meetings? No, he's not, have, not replacing. Just a minute, you do not have to hold it. Basically, if he decides that he wants the deal, he will give this kind of commitment, and you shouldn't be uh, required to bring it to the shareholder vote because it's only a formality. No, it's not a formality because he could sell his shares, take the premium, and leave the minority without the premium, okay? If the, if the minority says no for this deal, he can sell the controlling, the controlling stake in the company with the premium and leave the minority without the premium. He is giving the minority his premium, okay? He's sharing yeah. his premium with the minority. So, he, so once he does that, he can decide for the minority? You no, don't he decides for himself. He is a majority. But anyway, he is a majority in the shareholder meeting, okay? So anyway, if he raises his hands and say, I do, then th this transaction is happening. Why can't he? I mean, uh, guys, it's his. It's his property. He can do whatever he wants with that. And it's fine to say, I think this is the best offer, and I'm there for it. So, so maybe we should change corporate law and say that once you have a controlling shareholders, he can decide for the shareholders, and you don't have to, to bring it to, to their vote at, at yes, all. Yes, of course. Yes. May yes. <laughs> I believe this is a corporate law right now. Yeah. The major, if there is no conflict, the, the rule is the democracy. The majority decides. But you should majority, have a meeting, majority a real meeting yeah. when uh -huh. uh, if my young friend tell me, in Delaware, you can write, if there is a, a section in the bylaws, you can actually give a written consent by controlling shareholder, and there is no need for the uh, general meeting. This, is, this became 
just... But, but this uh, is not the rule in Israel. In Israel, you still have to go through the process, right? Yes, but this is a process. This, is a, this will be an empty process. If the controlling shareholder who doesn't have any conflict, this is the democracy in Israel. 51% get it all. And they will yeah, decide. But, 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 but you still need to hold the vote in yeah, some yes, point of time. And you need to hold it in a later period, in later time than the board decision. So something can happen in between. And why don't mm -hmm. allow, a, allow a choice? Yeah. OK. Um, uh, just to answer your question, uh, we assume that the port, let's assume that the port apply Omnicare. And we try to see if, uh, even though uh, it's, I mean, if we stand in the enhanced scrutiny conditions. So, uh, we have uh, we, we have, no, we, we, we have uh, a few and uh, try to shorten. Maybe, maybe because okay. we, we don't have much time. Two you minutes. have two minutes according yes. to okay. the control. So let's talk about <laughs> the, the former argument yeah, the of my the friends vote. from Waktel concerning whether there is force the vote in the Israeli law. Okay? Yeah. So yes, the answer is yes. And maybe you need? Yeah, okay. So we have uh, four uh, things to tell you about the, why we have forced to vote in Israel or why it is right to have forced to vote in Israel. Uh, we think that you've missed something uh, that uh, the company law, uh, unlike Delaware, allows a company uh, to include in Section uh, 324 of the Israeli company's law. Uh, to have conditions, to have emerging conditions, it's a, it's a very large section saying, um, and I'll uh, do it uh, quickly, that a, a merger can be subject to conditions. The board of directors can subject uh, a merger to condition. It is clear that the Israeli legislator allows the board to include a variety of conditions, including force the vote. Uh, and I want to emphasize that when the legislator wanted not uh, to approve uh, such variety of conditions in a tender offer, for example, um, he said it specifically. So um, what should we make of the fact that the Israeli legislature has not explicitly adopted a right to a force the vote provision as Delaware has done in section 146? No, um, um, I'll, I'll be there. We, we don't think you need to adopt a special section, okay? Um, as Udi said, we think that this forced the vote, I mean, it's a mistake, in our view, uh, Van Gogh was a mistake, and you need to, uh, I mean, you need to do something with this mistake. We don't have this mistake in Israel, so you don't have to repair anything, okay? We are starting that um, at the beginning, the company's law um, has a general section saying that the board of directors can put conditions in a merger. He can do the merger in conditions, unlike a tender offer, where they don't allow it, okay? They say only this and that. So, I mean, you can't ignore the, ob the obvious difference between a merger and a tender offer in this uh, uh, specific issue. Second is, um, as, uh, as you said before, um, the, the law say that the board needs to approve, it doesn't mention recommend. So we think that you can leave this approval uh, to, the show, to the shareholders meeting, put everything in front of them, say that you, you have a, a, an offer, if you decide that it's a superior offer, okay? The, the board here didn't decide that it's a superior offer because we don't think it's a superior offer because of the uh, antitrust, but I leave it. But here you can do it, and then if the shareholders doesn't, I mean, don't uh, approve the deal, then you can bring another one. Uh, we have, um, um, and, and we just want to emphasize that um, uh, uh, we recommend not to go to the, you know, actual language of the law, because if you're going to the actual language of the law, then you don't need a general meeting in, a, in, in such a merger in Israel at all, okay? You can look at the 320, uh, section 320 in the company's law, when it's a reverse triangle merger that they didn't think of, uh, it doesn't meet the conditions saying in this section, but it's the only thing. And uh, third thing is what I said about Van Gorkum in 1985, uh, actually uh, they needed uh, to do it, and as our uh, esteemed colleague said, it's, it's been, what, a decade and 25 amendments. They could amend it if they thought they should. 
And the, the, I mean, the last one is, as a, uh, our esteemed uh, colleague said, that uh, there's a, a claim that there's a problem uh, with the public ground policy. I mean, uh, force the vote, uh, this provision will be unwise on a public uh, policy ground. So in Israel, it's unwise, and it's Delaware, it's OK. The public policy is fine. We couldn't see how uh, this thing is uh, with the force the vote. Okay. Um, and uh, I think that um, and that's the, it. That's it. Okay. May the force be with you. Yeah. yeah. May the force be with <laughs> the us. Force be with <laughs> us. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we went out and returned. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so it well. seems that I'm in a minority, but. Uh, I will start or? Please. Okay. So uh, we were presented with a hard case. There is no Israeli precedent directly applicable to these complicated issues, and thus we can only suggest tentative first impressions about the legal questions, certainly not a well-formed opinion. Regretted, regrettably, my professional expertise does not include a deep understanding of Delaware law, or any, uh, therefore, I will limit my comments to analyzing the case under Israeli law and leave the much richer and sophisticated Delaware jurisprudence to my esteemed colleagues. The case presents two kinds of protection devices. One is the commitment taken by face board of directors, uh, a, force to, a force to vote provision and a breakup fee of $65 million. And second, a, commi a commitment taken by Zeus uh, the controlling shareholder of faith, uh, an obligation to vote for the TIC merger and against any other offer for uh, 18 months. The combined outcome of this arrangement seems to be that the shareholder's vote is strictly formal. Whether or not the deal is beneficial to the shareholders when they meet to vote, their vote is inconsequential. In other words, the game was fixed. It was fixed in advance by the board and the controlling shareholders, and the shareholders vote is only for the record. Should this reality bother us? This is the question in this case. From a formal perspective, obviously yes. But from an economic perspective, maybe not so much. The statutory requirement under section uh, 314 and 320A of the Israeli Companies Law is that a merger need to be approved by the general meeting of both company, companies. The protection devices adopted in this case practically circumvents this requirement. It may force a merger on faith shareholders, even if there is a better offer on the table. That, that is the situation that we face. It denies them the option to benefit from any positive prospect that may appear after the board decision and before the shareholders vote. The fact that the directors sought and received a fiduciary out provision demonstrate that they were aware of the problematic nature of the situation in which they could be. And if they are allowed to protect themselves from this problematic situation, why should the shareholders be put uh, in such a, a, a position? However, from an economic perspective, being able to shut your eyes and ears to further offers after the negotiation had ended is not such a bad idea. It may allow the shareholders to receive a better offer during the negotiation stage and prevent it from being tempted by the siren song of a later offer. Uh, just recently, I rejected an appeal uh, to allow a much better late bid to be submitted after a land auction had ended, it's a case I decided um, I think a month ago, there was a, an auction for a certain piece of land in Hoda Sharon. Uh, during the auction, uh, the, the, the highest bid was 81, 81 million shekels, quite a lot. Uh, and after the auction was over, one of the bidders suggested 90 million uh, sh uh, shekels for, for the same land. Uh, and, we pre and we prevented this deal uh, from being offered uh, to, to the court. So if, uh, if we uh, end the negotiation process in some stage when it concerns land, why not when we are talking about selling a company? 
I move now to examine each of the three protective measures that the plaintiff seeks to invalidate. The fourth, the vote provision, breaker fees, and controlling shareholders, shareholders uh, obligation. The fourth, the vote provision, seems to me legitimate. Israeli law allows fiduciaries to take a personal obligation to bring a contract that requires judicial approval before the court within a reasonable time, as long as they do not oblige themselves to support it under all circumstances. This is uh, the case of Shapir versus Eshed. It concerned uh, um, 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 a fiduciary for minor uh, that uh, made this obligation, and the court said that that is fine. It seems to me that the, uh, the force the vote commitment is a similar kind of commitment, as long as uh, the directors brings the full information to the, uh, to the shareholders, uh, I think they are allowed to make the commitment, uh, to make such a commitment. Breaker fees are also lawful in my view, as long as they do not step over their legitimate purpose. We do not, the argument didn't refer to breaker fees, but uh, I, I will do so because it appears in the written uh, arguments. Uh, the legitimate purpose of breaker fees is to reembrace the first bidder for its expenditure and opportunity cost in case the deal will not go through. As long as the breakup fees are limited to a reasonable amount that serve this goal, they should be upheld. However, breakup fees that are employed in order to force the merger on the shareholder are obviously, obviously illegal. In the present case, 6.5% or $65 million seems, at least according to my humble standards, excessive. And therefore, I would think that the court will intervene. I don't know the, the exact kind of intervention, whether we uh, will say that uh, there is no breaker fees or uh, will allow us a, a smaller amount like uh, we do in other cases. I don't know uh, how we will deal with it. And last but not least, I think this is the main precaution that was taken here, the controlling shareholders' commitment to support the merger proposal and to vote against any other merger for 18 months, this seems to me the most problematic of the protective me measures under Israeli law. I'm not sure that it does not bring Zeus to the position of having a personal interest in the merger under Section 274 for of the Israeli companies law. So uh, the, the question is, once those take this kind of commitment, should we not say that it has a personal interest in the merger once it is brought to the uh, General Assembly? Um, if so, uh, then it will trigger the requirement for a majority from the minority under Section 20, 2075A of the Company Act, uh, and the result uh, is not that the protective measure will be held invalid, but that uh, it will be ineffective, because I guess that there will not be a majority of the minority in this case, but it will still give the, the shareholders, the, the, the minority shareholders, the ability uh, to, to vote. Uh, so what it means is that the minority will have the power to veto the merger after all. Warning, I'm not certain that this is the right legal analysis, and I'm certainly uh, not sure that this is the efficient economic outcome, but I'm not sh sure either that it's not. In any case, since this is a mock trial, we still have time to think, think things through before deciding on such complicated matters in the context of a real litigation. Thank you. I am going to vote to decline to enjoin the merger of FaceCorp and Tick Inc. I do not believe that the plaintiffs have shown a reasonable likelihood of succeeding on the merits of their claim that the directors of Face breached their fiduciary duties by entering into the merger agreement with Tick. The deal protection devices that were agreed upon include a force the vote provision that we heard an awful lot about today which has not been adopted explicitly by the Israeli company's law that binds face, as it has been adopted in Delaware in section 146 of the DGCL. 
the plaintiffs say that this provision in the merger agreement, coupled with the shareholder agreement with Zeus, the 51% stockholder, renders the merger agreement invalid since it effectively locks up the deal. The plaintiffs are correct that in the Omnicare decision from 2003, the Delaware Supreme Court rejected a similar combination of deal protection devices. Omnicare, which has itself been subject to scrutiny and implied narrowly in Delaware, has not been explicitly adopted by the courts of Israel, and with all due respect to the Delaware courts, I submit that it should not be followed today. I'll start as I must with the relevant standard of review that applies to the plaintiff's claims. There's a strong argument to be made that the business judgment rule should apply. As the plaintiffs acknowledge, the face board is not alleged to have had any self-interest in the merger, and its due care and good faith are not in question. The plaintiffs advocate instead for the strict application of the UNICAL intermediate standard of review. In prior cases where Israeli courts have applied the UNICAL standard, specifically by my colleague on the panel, the directors allegedly had entrenchment motives, but nothing of that sort is alleged here. But even if this court were to follow the approach of Omnicare and other Delaware courts in applying enhanced scrutiny in reviewing the deal protection mechanisms, the plaintiffs would not succeed. The UNICAL analysis proceeds in two stages. First, the Board of Face must demonstrate that they have reasonable grounds for believing that a danger to corporate policy and effectiveness existed without the deal protection measures. The court largely looks to the motives of the board in this phase of the analysis. Here, the evidence presented indicates that the board was motivated by securing the best transaction for FACE and its stockholders. The record demonstrates that FACE's board had grounds to believe that they would lose the deal with TIC if they did not approve the inclusion of the deal protection devices. TIC's $12 per share offer, later $12.50 per share, was conditioned upon the deal protection devices, thus providing TIC with deal certainty. And at the time the FACE board agreed to that deal, Meta had only offered $11, and moreover, a deal with Meta creates significant antitrust concerns and risk. The analysis next proceeds into the second stage of enhanced scrutiny, which looks to the means used by the board in furtherance of its motive and whether its actions were justified. The measure of the board's actions should be ones of good faith and reasonableness. Here I believe that the means utilized were reasonably intended to accomplish the valid objectives of the board, which again was to secure what it concluded was certainty in securing a favorable transaction for FACE and its stockholders. The board's efforts in negotiating led to another 50 cents per share, in part because of the certainty it could offer to tick. It's difficult for me to see how these efforts taken in good faith could amount to a breach of the director's fiduciary duties. If a rote application of UNICAL was followed, it would itself have two steps. The board would be required to establish that the deal protection devices, one, are not coercive or preclusive, and two, are within a range of reasonable responses to the danger of corporate policy and effectiveness. I'll take each in turn. First, I cannot conclude that the devices were preclusive to other bidders. They didn't stop Meta from coming forward with a $15 per share offer. The matter thus turns largely on whether the devices were coercive in the context of the stockholder vote. The devices taken separately are not coercive in my view. The plaintiffs are correct that the company's law has not expressly blessed force the vote provisions in a merger agreement but nothing in Israeli law provides that they're not permissible, and as the defendants argued today, the company's law allows for conditions to be included in a merger agreement. It was intended to provide TIC with some measure of deal certainty that TIC required and that FACE itself needed. Force the vote provisions can have the effect of allowing the stockholders of the target to retain the power to determine whether to vote for an offer based upon the board's recommendation. That is generally consistent with principles of Delaware corporate law embraced by Israeli courts. I also see no basis to hold that the Zeus shareholder agreement could support a fiduciary duty claim against the FACE board, which had nothing to do with that agreement, unlike the board in Omnicare. 
Same with the termination fee. It is on the high side for what Delaware courts have approved, but I have no reason to conclude on the record before me that it rises to the level of coercive. In Williams versus Geyer, the Delaware Supreme Court explained that deal protection measures may be found coercive and improper if they have the effect of causing stockholders to vote in favor of the proposed deal for some reason other than its merits. There's no evidence of that in this case. The central question is whether those devices taken together as they act in concert and are properly reviewed as such, rise together to the level of coerciveness. In other words, does the combination of the force the vote provision along with the Zeus shareholder agreement and the termination fee coerce faces stockholders? If, as in the Orman versus Coleman decision by the Court of Chancery, the board had negotiated for a majority of the minority vote requirement, this may be a very simple analysis. In Orman, the court said that an 18-month lockup was not coercive because, one, the board negotiated for a fiduciary out, allowing it to change its recommendation, and two, the stockholders who were not locked up retained the power to reject the deal. Here, the board had a fiduciary out, like in Orman, that would allow it to continue to exercise its fiduciary duties in recommending that the stockholders vote down a merger in the case of a superior offer. The board's voice is not stifled and its hands are not tied. Notably, the face board has not yet declared the meta offer superior, and it may not, given the risks associated with that deal. As the plaintiffs argue, however, the minority stockholders effectively lack the power to reject the tick deal, which is a distinction from Orman versus Coleman. If the board determines that Meta is a superior transaction and recommends against the tick deal, the vote must still occur and Zeus is still bound to vote for it. Yet I do not believe that the board's actions in approving the deal with these measures in place could be viewed as coercive and effectively a breach of fiduciary duty. It is unclear to me why Zeus's decision to support the deal means that the minority is coerced. Zeus was not coerced. It determined that the tick deal was the best option. Nothing in the briefing asserts that Zeus was a conflicted controller, and even as the defendants argue, its support is further evidence that the tick deal is a good one. It's also unclear to me why a minority stockholder would feel coerced to vote for the tick merger because Zeus was agreeing to it. As one of the dissents in the Omnicare decision points out, this would be meaningless coercion to the extent that it can be called coercion at all because the minority knew that the controlling votes were already cast. There's no meaningful minority vote to coerce. Ultimately, I believe that the board's actions were reasonable in relation to the threat posed, which was losing the sale of tick at a time when the company needed to be sold and being left with a highly risky offer from Meta. The board's actions in approving the merger agreement, including the deal protection measures, were not unreasonable or disproportionate. The board fulfilled its fiduciary duties by negotiating what it believed to be the best deal reasonably available to it. Now, if it decides that the meta deal at $15 is superior, it has the right to change its mind. In short, even a per se lockup is not, in my view, necessarily a violation of the board's fiduciary duties. Tick demanded certainty. The board, after careful consideration, made the reasoned choice to give Tick that certainty and in doing so achieved another $50 per share for stockholders. I therefore vote to decline to enjoin the deal from proceeding. Okay, <laughs> I will be very brief. Uh, I <clears throat> add my vote to uh, the thorough opinion of my colleague, Vice Chancellor Will. Um, the way I thought about this um, case was uh, by thinking what would I want as a minority shareholder in uh, face uh, had I been <coughs> under the veil of eager ignorance at the point of time uh, before the negotiations be began. And I think uh, at that point of time the best rule the minority shareholders would wish uh, the court to adopt would be the rule of law saying that uh, the uh, 
uh, board is able to act as it did and that the um, voting agreement should be valid because at that point of time uh, the contract is negotiated and as we know contracts are an exchange of freedom for certainty, for a price. And the more certainty you get, the higher the price you are willing to pay. Uh, and since at that point of p time the minority share shareholders want the price to be the best price possible, then the way to uh, get to that uh, uh, goal is by allowing the company to uh, act as it did uh, and to uh, get into uh, the agreement with TIC. Uh, that would be the final agreement and uh, not to um, allow other future uh, bidders like uh, Meta in our case that were not present at that time, of, uh, at that time to uh, come along later and uh, improve the bid. And that's why, as I said, I, I add my vote to <laughs> Chancellor, Vice Chancellor's 